If you'd remain standing for the reading of the word, please. I'm gonna be reading out of Mark chapter two and let this be a weekly reminder. I'm encouraging y'all, if you could bring your Bibles with you, let, let's make that a habit. If you don't have a Bible, I and mean, if you, maybe you're visiting today, there are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. Please feel free to take that with you. The words will be on the screen. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Kiddos, follow your fearless leader, Pastor Laura, over to elementary. What's up, my dude? Bye, Zane. Have fun, guys. Bye, Laura. Zayla, you coming too? There we go. Bye, kiddo. Let's give it up for our kids today. Good job. Sharla, don't leave. Sharla, don't leave. Charlotte's been out on, on, on vacation for a couple weeks, avoiding this very moment. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you how old Charlotte turned this summer, but it was the exact same age that I turned when I turned 50 this summer. <laughs> so, Charlotte, happy whatever birthday it is to you, but we love you so much. Me, Roger, and Sharla, we are triplets from another mother. We look just alike. We look identical triplets. Oh, my goodness. How are you all doing? We good? We good? Um, this morning, let's talk about awkward moments for a minute. Awkward moments. In our family, my family, I am the king of awkward moments. Everybody, if, if you are that role in your family, raise your hand proudly with me. If you are the one that everybody else sweats about, what's going to come out of this Guy, normally, it's the guy. What's going to come out of their mouth? That, that, that is me. You guys know some of my awkward moments. Um, up until July 2024, my most awkward moment came in eighth grade when I had to do an oral book report. And you got to choose any book you want. And I chose Dear God, It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. <laughs> Um, because Judy Bloom wrote Super Fudge and Fudge, and I'm like, she's a good writer of boy books. Dear God, It's Me, Margaret is not about boys at all. Um, it's about a teenage girl hitting puberty. And I had no clue, no clue. And I didn't have to just do a book report. I had to do an oral book report. And I gave the oral book report and got done with it. And it wasn't until years later I knew what I was talking about. So that used to be my most awkward moment. But then Independence Day 2024 happened. It was like three or four weeks ago, y'all. Um, this is what happened. We were at Hutchinson Island on our, on our beach trip, and Independence Day, Haley's at home. She wasn't with us, so me, Caden, and Melanie went to dinner, and we went to just this random seafood restaurant that we go to every time we are there, and our server comes up and asks for our order and our drinks, and he's speaking with an accent, and I, we are everybody, all three of us, we're absolutely convinced it's an Irish or Scottish accent. It's, I mean, it sounds like Louise, and so we're like, it's an Irish accent. And so we hear this, and I don't worry, I haven't said anything yet. This isn't the awkward moment. It's coming, and it's a doozy. So he, he, I, I hear this accent. He goes, and he goes and gets our drinks, but while he's getting his drink, our drinks, he goes to another table next to us and takes their drink order, and it's a different accent. And I'm like, this dude is playing a game. Like, he's using one accent with every different table. He's, he's just having fun. And I'm like, that's impressive. Like, I was seriously impressed by this dude playing this game with all these tables. So, of course, when he comes over, because I am Don Duford's son, if you don't know that, that's my dad, and he would absolutely say something. So he comes back over to the table, and I'm sure Melanie and Caden, the introverts that they are, like, please don't say anything. Please don't say anything. <laughs> I'm going to say something because I'm impressed. So I'm like, hey, man, what accent are you going to use with us now that you're changing accents every single table? I'm like, is that an Irish accent? And he's like, no, I'm from northern Minnesota. 
what? Northern, it didn't sound like Minnesota at all. I'm like, oh, my bad. I thought you were playing a game where you're doing a different accent at every single table. He's like, no, some people think that I have an accent. Let me tell you why I have an accent. You ready for this? Because I was in the military and in Afghanistan, I had mortar blow up my face. And I've been in physical therapy and reconstructive surgeries for eight years running. And so it messes with my accent. You're feeling it, right? You don't even know if you should laugh or what you should do. Ladies and gentlemen, this was at the beginning of our meal. I still had to sit through this whole thing and pray that he didn't do stuff to my food. And I apologize profusely. You better believe I tipped him well, really, really well that day. And so poor Melanie and Caden, they had to endure that and go through that. But I'm known for that. I'm known for doing stupid stuff and making awkward moments and engaging in the awkward Engaging in the awkward. My friend Grant, just last story. This is a quick one. My friend Grant, he's, he's the South African who now pastors in San Diego, and he's a helpless romantic. Like, he's uncomfortable romantic. He's one of those guys. Like, come on, man. It's just, yeah. And so when he wanted to tell his then-girlfriend, soon-to-be wife, that he was in love with her, like, that day. You know, that moment, guys, when you got to tell her that you love her and you got to engage in this awkward conversation. But if you want the relationship to go to the next level, these words must be spoken. So it was time for Grant to say, Michelle, I love you. And what came out of his mouth was, Michelle, I'm smitten with you. (laughs) That's weird. That's weird. If you're a teenager and you're preparing for that moment in your future, don't use those words. So that, that, that didn't do anything to Michelle's heart other than freak her out. It, it really freaked her out when she did that. Like, I am smitten. Who says that? Who, who even uses the word smitten in their vocabulary? So I'm, I'm smitten with you. So we all do it. Some of us more than others, where, where, where we are pros at the awkward moments or the awkward conversations. And the reason I'm bringing this up the whole reason that I'm using this as our, our, our transition point, or our pivot point this morning, is because we're talking about evangelism. We're talking about sharing our faith with other people. And in order to do that, when, I mean, there's no denying it. There's no walking around it. In order to share our faith with other people, for some of us in this room, it means engaging in the awkward. Engaging in the uncomfortable, engaging in a conversation that isn't the easiest conversation in the world for any of us or all of us to have. Some of you guys just love it. You, you eat it up. But others of us in this room, it's difficult for us to do. Others of us, we want the quote that is notoriously given or assigned to St. Francis of Assisi to be true. And listen, I don't know how many of you guys are big St. Francis of Assisi fans in here. Pretty good early church father. But he's attributed with a quote that he never said. And it's not the fullness of it. And he's not wrong in it. It's just not the whole truth. And I brought this up slightly at the beginning of this series where St. Francis of Assisi is assigned with the quote that says, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. When necessary, use words. That sounds good. It sounds glorious, right? Especially all of the introverts and all of us that don't want to engage in those awkward conversations with the gospel. You mean I can just live my life as a Christian and allow my light, allow my life to preach the gospel? Well, the beauty of it, the truth of that, is that Jesus says something similar in Matthew chapter 5, right? In the the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So that's good. We want our life to scream, I follow Jesus. But our life story in the way we live our lives is not the gospel. The gospel is a spoken word. So in order for somebody to come to Christ, in order for somebody to understand Christ's redemptive purposes and to understand the gospel that we've been talking about in this entire series, where God is holy, mankind apart from God is wicked and depraved because of our sin. But praise be to God, everything we've sung about this morning was that in God's beauty and graciousness and mercy, he sent his son to be our substitutionary atonement for our sins, to be our redemptive plan for our sin. And then finally, how do we respond to that? Nobody's going to get that plan or understand the gospel because you're living a clean life. However, when we live that life that reflects Jesus, hopefully they'll see Christ in us, ask questions, see things, and then we enter into those engaging conversations. And I think we wish sometimes that evangelism was done that way, where, hey, see my life and come to Jesus, drop everything, and now I'm just going to come to Jesus. Or evangelism is done through osmosis, and I don't ever have to say anything But like I said, evangelism, sharing the gospel, is a spoken word. It's something we have to engage in. And you know this. You know this. In every area of your life, sometimes there's conversations that have to be had 
really tough, awkward conversations that have to be had in order for a relationship or a moment to progress, right? Bosses, there's tough conversations you've had to have with your employers. Employees, there's tough conversations you've had to have with your bosses. Husbands and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, there are things that need to be said. Parents with your kids, kids with your parents in order for this to happen. Just like with Grunt. He, at some point in a relationship when your boyfriend, girlfriend, and you think it's heading somewhere, you're going to have to say those really awkward words. And they're not awkward words, except you don't know how they're going to respond. You're going to throw those words of, I love you. You're going to throw those out there, hoping that they don't respond with, okay, right? You're hoping it's reciprocal and you get something back. So you're entering, you're risking everything by putting it out there. And so we engage in these really tough conversations. Here, here's the disconnect with Christians. And this, this is me preaching at me. So if it sounds harsh, I'm talking to myself, okay? I, I, I don't have any Barna research. I don't have the numbers, but I would imagine almost all, if, if not every, Christian would say it's really important for those that I love that don't know Jesus to come to Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. I want them to have a relationship with Jesus. I want them in heaven with me. It's really, really important. Matter of fact, it's critical. It's vital. It's paramount in my life that those that I love, that those that God has put in my mission field, my, my circle of influence, that they come to Jesus. It's really important. So we say that's important, but there's a disconnect because how many of us are actually sharing the most important news we know with those very people who need Jesus? And we're doing the St. Francis of Assisi thing. We're like, I'm modeling it, so it's all good. And kudos for modeling. But at some point, we have to enter into that awkward conversation. Remember, the illustration this entire series has been, we don't want evangelism to be a burden. Evangelism is not intended. It should never be a burden. It's intended to be a blessing. Where Almighty God, in all his omnipotence, in all his glory, in all his mercy, has chosen you and me, weak, weak vessels, as instruments, not only for God's glory, but for the salvation of other people, which brings God glory. He didn't have to, but he chose to use me and you, weak vessels, to bring people to his son. So there's a blessing in that. It's not intended to be a burden. And those things in our life, this is the illustration we've used over and over again, those things in our life that we're passionate about, we tell everybody about. Whether it's you guys with your essential oils. I don't know why I pick on you guys so hard. Essential oil people, you guys are passionate. You are very passionate about, because you believe those remedies can help people. You're not doing it just because it's an oil. You're doing it because you want to help people. About twice a year, Steve Mon will text me with a meal that he ate or a drink that he had or a restaurant that they found. And then we go and we're like, yeah, he loves me. Like, he loves me. He shared this good news with me. He cares enough about me to share this good news with me. This is what the gospel is supposed to be. It's the most important message of our life. So the story that we're looking at today is one of my favorite stories. And I found something out about this story that maybe you already know, knew. Duran already knew it. I didn't know it. And I read it this week. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. It doesn't change anything. It's just really interesting. And we'll lean into that in just a moment. But this story in Mark chapter 2 addresses this idea of a group of friends who need to introduce their friend to Jesus for what Jesus can do. And in this story, ladies and gentlemen, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, and it demands really, really bold action on behalf of these four friends of this paralytic man. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to kind of go memento with you. If you've never seen the movie Memento, it starts in the end and ends in the beginning, kind of like Benjamin Button. There's some weird 90s movies that go backwards. So let's start backwards. Mark chapter 2, verse 12. This is the end. The paralytic has been healed, and this is what happens. This paralytic man rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before everyone. So he's just walking out in front of everyone, and they were all amazed and glorified God, and they said, we have never seen anything like this. I think that's a pretty good response. In, what, in light of what I just read just a moment ago, and you kind of know the story a little bit, would you not say that that's a pretty good response? Hey, I've never seen anything like this. And it's like, let's ask ourselves, what have they just seen that they've never seen before? Well, they just saw Jesus, first of all, read the minds of people in the room. He read their spirits. He's like, okay, this is what's going on in their heart. They're not cool with something I just said. Or maybe they've never seen four friends that love a friend so much that they did the unthinkable. 
And we'll talk through this in a minute. It's not that they just dug a hole in a roof and dropped this guy down. They got him here. And they, there had to be some planning and some really hard work to get this guy here. So maybe they've never seen anything like that. Maybe they've never seen anybody stand up in a room and tell somebody, your sins are forgiven. Because that's weird. Like, I, I would imagine you've never declared that in your living room when people are there. I forgive you of all your sins, and now you're good for eternity's sake, right? You don't have that power. And then finally, maybe it was the fact that a guy that came in a roof on a mat, couldn't walk, totally crippled, is now walking. Maybe that's what they've never seen before. No matter which one of those it is, this is a pretty incredible story. And, and for those of us that grew up on this story, which if you're in kids' ministry, this is one of the popular ones because it's just cool, right? It's just like they drilled a hole in the roof or cut a hole in the roof and let this guy down, and he walked away, and he could walk, and it was incredible. I, I think those of us that have heard this story so often in our lives have neutered it. We, we've lost the awe of it because things like this aren't supposed to happen on any level whatsoever, and yet here it is. Four friends love their friend enough to get him to Jesus, and Jesus does something so incredibly remarkable that all they can say at the end of it is, we've never seen anything like this. Now, here's what's going on in the story, because we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're talking about the end. Let's now go back to the beginning of the story. This story is insane. What we find in Mark's gospel, and we've talked about this a couple weeks ago, Mark's gospel is the simple of, simplest of the four gospels. It's the outline version. So Matthew and, and, and Luke will use Mark as an outline and put meat on the bones for them. But Mark jumps into it right away. In Mark chapter 1, he's talking about all of these things that Jesus is doing. And in Mark chapter 1, we find that there are so many people following Jesus. He's, he's become a figure that everybody wants to get to know. There, there's buzz about him. The, the teenagers want to know, what's the T? That's me being cool. What's the information? What's going on with this guy? I want to know what he's doing. So everybody wants to get around Jesus. And we find in Mark's gospel, he says that there's so many people that the doors are filled. Like there's no more room in this house. And here's what amazed me. If we go to Mark chapter two, starting with verse one, let, let me just read this first sentence to you. And this is what blew me away. And I, I'm easily blown away. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. I've never seen that. that that's just, I've never seen that. Like, I've gone through this story going, we're about to tear a hole in somebody's roof. How mad must the owner of that house been when the roof is opened? And there in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, it says Jesus is at home. Now, that doesn't mean it's Jesus' house. Could be. There, there's verses that point that it's probably not Jesus' house when he says the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. But it's likely that he's either at his mother's house, right? It could be Mary's house. Or it could be Peter, Simon Peter and Andrew's house. It, it's, it's a familiar house. But Jesus is now at home. And many were gathered together, so there was no more room, not even at the door. So in this, it's like we find that the door is filled, but now there's so many people wanting to get a glimpse of Jesus that this place is packed. Like the word has leaked. Jesus is in town. The celebrity is in town. So everybody rushes to his house or Mary's house or Peter's house or whoever's house it is. They all want to get a look at him. And the first ones there get the prime seats. Like, like Jesus is maybe in the center of the room and all these people are sitting around him. If they had sofas or whatever they had back in the day, they're sitting on them. They're, they're smushed up against each other. People at the door peeking in, hoping to get a whiff of the conversation that's taking place. People peeking in the windows. Just everybody there or everywhere, there's people. This is the influence that Jesus had. Everybody wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. They wanted to hear the words that he was speaking. And Jesus is there in the midst of it, preaching and teaching the word. And then all of a sudden, Mark makes this awkward transition. It's a weird transition. Right, right away in verse 3, it says, and they came. Well, who are they? Well, fortunately for us, he fills in the blanks for us. These are his four friends, the four friends of the paralytic. So they came, bringing to Jesus a paralytic carried by four men. So here comes these four guys and this paralytic. And when they could not hear Jesus because of the crowd, of course, they did what was normal. This is what any sane person would do. They removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, here, here's what I want us to notice. This is the takeaway for, for today. These four friends, whoever these guys are, we don't know their names. We don't know the name of the paralytic. We just know Jesus, right? Why? 
Because this story's main character, the subject of this story, is Jesus. It's not the paralytic. It's not the four friends. Jesus will always be the primary character of these, these stories. And so we know his, his name. But these four friends were willing to do whatever it took, whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. And they were not going to stop until they could get him to him. Now, imagine this, because we just got what happened in this moment. Like, hey, there's a hole in the roof. The guy's let down, and Jesus heals him. But think about all the planning that went on prior to this moment, okay? Maybe they didn't have a lot of time. All of a sudden, Jesus is in town. Jesus surprises everybody. Hey, Jesus is home. He's in the house, whether it's his house, Mary's house, Peter's house. He's at home, and now the whole town is surrounding this house, it's probably like what it would be like in Los Angeles when you're doing these famous tours and you're, hey, this is where Brad Pitt lives. This is where this person lives and people are there. Well, this is Jesus. This is a really big deal. So I don't know how the word spread, but word spread. Now everybody is at this house and these friends, this is how good their, their friendship is. Their first instinct, their first thought was we have to get our friend to Jesus. We gotta get this guy to Jesus. We've got a friend who can't walk, totally paralyzed, and we've heard that Jesus has done miraculous things where he has healed people in his condition, so let's get our friend to Jesus. Now, think about how much work this was. This was before trucks, right? I don't know if they had wheelbarrows. I, I, I don't know what they had. I'm imagining it, these four friends getting their guy on a mat. This might be totally inaccurate. I don't know, but this is how I picture it. Every one of them, like pallbearers, taking a corner of the mat and trying to walk to wherever Jesus' house is from their place of residence or from the paralytic's house, right? So they've all got the corner. And you know how you walk when it's like, four, it's like a three-legged race? Like, you don't walk normally. You're, like, you're doing the awkward shuffle and hoping not to drop this dude. So this is a lot of work. You've literally got dead weight as you're carrying this guy to this house just so he can meet Jesus or Jesus can touch him. And it's incredible what they had to do, how much work they had to put into it. And they were probably out of breath. It's probably exhausting. I get, I, honestly, I get tired climbing those steps now. And, and these guys are walking through this with four, four guys carrying this paralyzed man to Jesus. Now, here's what they had to believe. This is really important. Somewhere in their deepest part of their soul, they had to believe that if they did their part, if they did their part, and what was their part? Their part was bringing their friend to Jesus that God might do something. Remember, we talked about this last week. Evangelism isn't let's bring people to Jesus and then they get converted and then it's evangelism. It's, they might, but they might not. But our job as witnesses is to present Jesus to them. That's our job. Salvation is mine, says the Lord. It's not mine. I, I don't determine whether or not this person is gonna come to Christ. That's between them and God. Right? So their job is, let's bring our friend to Jesus with the hopes that Jesus might do something in their life. And I want us to notice something right off the bat in this story. These guys had incredible faith because there was absolutely no guarantee that their friend would be healed. There was no guarantee. But their job was to bring their friend to Jesus. And from there, the results of that were in God's hands. And so they do this. They're probably, just imagine walking through town, people staring at you, you're carrying a paralytic. Now, people probably understand that because there's probably other people doing this as well, bringing their friend to Jesus. So they're walking through town. They finally get to this house, whoever's house it is. And can you imagine when you show up and there's so many people that you can't even see the front door? Can you imagine how disappointed you'd be? Like, you, you've gone to the greatest lengths possible to get your friend here, and you show up, and there's no path to Jesus. You can't get him there. Now, listen, when it comes to evangelism, just red flag for us all, when it comes to evangelism, how many of us would see that red flag and say, well, I tried, and stop there? You're like, I did my best. Like, I, I, I tried, I gave it one shot, and, and now it's done, it's over. The blood's not on my hands anymore. We're, we're good because I've tried, right? But these friends didn't take this as a reason to stop. They kept going. You can see it going on in their minds. We don't have all the details. How they thought of the roof. Like, who was it that said, hey, you know, we can't get to the front door and the windows seem blocked, but there's one access point to this house that is untouched. Like, what access point is that? Well, look at the roof. Yeah, like, yeah it's a roof. And I don't know if anybody else does this, but have you ever been on I-4 when it's at a standstill? 
And, and wives, have you ever watched your husband's mind start calculating? Like if we get off here and we go through this subdivision and this subdivision, we can go all the back roads and we can figure out a new path to get home and we can beat the clock. And then they do it and you end up at home half an hour later than you would have if you stayed on I-4. Well, these guys, you can see their minds percolating. They're like, okay, we can't get to the front door. We can't get through the windows. What can we do? Ah, let's go through the roof. Let's go through the roof. Because there's massive logistical issues in play here where there's no way to get this guy to Jesus, but they had to. They were not taking no for an answer. They were not allowing the obstacles in the way to be the reason that they stopped trying to get their friend to Jesus. So they said, how about the roof? Now, this is where the story gets incredibly awesome and awkward and inconvenient all at the same time. Imagine you're in that room with Jesus. So Jesus is in the center of the room, and he's teaching. He's teaching about the kingdom of God. There are people on the, on the floor listening. Maybe there's babies crying. Maybe there, there's people just observing all around, and it's sweaty. Maybe it's stinky. It's just it's this moment, but it's important. We're clinging to the words of Jesus. And then you hear stuff going on above you. You hear some clamoring on the roof. Now, it would be different than us here in America, because the roofing system was different. Wooden beams with bulrushes and, and, and um, some palm branches or whatever on top, covered by dried mud. So they're walking on the roof, and you can hear it. And you're like, huh, I wonder what's going on. And all of a sudden, flakes start falling from the sky. And I'm just, I mean, this is not biblical at all, so just go with me. Maybe little kids are like, oh, it's snow, like chocolate snow, like falling. <laughs> I'm from Michigan. We're, we're told, do not put chocolate snow in your mouth, okay? So chocolate snow coming, coming down from the sky, and you're, like, you're seeing all this, like, what's going on? And somebody starts cutting into the roof, starts cutting into the roof, and all of a sudden there's a thud because the big piece that has to fit a body through it is removed from the roof. So whether it dropped to the ground or they pulled it away, either way, this small house is now covered in dust. People are coughing, People are like, what in the world? They're, they're, they've interrupted Jesus. How rude, right? This is totally inconvenient. This is totally uncouth. And here they are with a hole in the roof. Everybody's wondering what's up. And these four guys look down. And there's Jesus. And Jesus obviously knows what's going on. But at the same time, he's like, what's up, guys? Like, hey, Jesus, we have a friend that needs you. Now, Jesus is so impressed with these friends because of their dedication to their guy that he's not mad or anything. Like, I think if it was my house or my friend's house, we'd have issues, right? Because now I've got a hole in my roof. And this is Israel. This is Capernaum. This isn't Orlando where you have sunlights in your living room. This is just an open hole in your house, in the roof. And it's an absolute mess, and again, I think we're so used to this story that we don't see what's going on. Oh, yeah, of course. They cut a roof in the house, or the roof of the house, and they lowered a paralytic man down into it for Jesus to heal. No, 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 no. No. They cut a hole in somebody's roof of their house and lowered a paralytic man, got the paralytic man onto the roof. That, might, that must have been an ordeal. And then once the hole is dug, then they're like, you know what? Let's just lower them down to Jesus and see what happens. That's a big deal, guys. That's a really big deal. And look how Jesus warmly responds to them. He doesn't get angry. He's not upset. He's impressed. Mark 2, verse 5. And Jesus saw their faith. That's the thing Jesus saw. That's incredible. Jesus didn't see their rebellion. He didn't see their awkwardness. He, he, he didn't see, hey, you ruined my roof, man. He saw their faith. And so because of their faith, he says to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes, because there always has to be a, a scribe or a Pharisee in the, in the story. If there's a bad guy, if there's a villain, it's always them. Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? So they're not saying it out loud. They're thinking it in their spirit. Why does this man say your sins are forgiven? He's blaspheming. He's not God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, I love this, immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they had questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. 
And he, <laughs> that's just funny. And go home. Don't stay here. You go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them so that they were all amazed. And they glorified God saying, we never have seen or we never saw anything like this. So this entire scenario had to be so incredibly awkward for these four friends. They took a serious risk in doing what they did. They didn't know how it was all going to play out. They didn't know how the homeowner was going to respond. They didn't know how Jesus was going to respond. But they did this for two reasons. Number one, they loved their friend, and he had a major need. They loved their friend enough to notice that he had a major need. And number two, they believed Jesus was the solution to what their friend needed. And as awkward as it had to have been, as inconvenient as it had to have been, they were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. Now, put yourself in the shoes, in their shoes, because in a minute, we're going to parlay this into you and I with those that we love and bringing them to Jesus. Put yourself in the shoes of the four friends. Think about everything working against them, and there was a lot of things working against them. Number one, it was inconvenient. It wasn't easy getting this dude to this house. It obviously took time because by the time they got there, this place was packed. Also, they had to carry a, a like dead weight on a mat with four guys through town to get him to this place. It was inconvenient. It wasn't easy. It was going to cost them something. Secondly, it had to be exhausting. Again, he was heavy and dead weight. We don't know how much he weighed, but no matter what, it's dead weight. Number three, it was time consuming. It was going to take them a majority of their day to go through this. Number four, it was going to cost them financially as well. Because no doubt the following day they had to run to Home Depot, grab some supplies, and come back and fix the hole in the roof, right? So they're taking a big risk. This was going to cost them, personally, it was going to cost them time, energy, money. Their reputation was at stake. Everything was at stake here. But they were doing whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. And here's the key in all of it for us when we're talking about evangelism. All they did was they made their lives available. They stopped what they were doing so they could help their friend have an encounter with Jesus and they were willing to do all of this to pay this incredible price because of who they believed Jesus was and what they believed Jesus could do. What they believed Jesus could do. So I asked myself, I'm like, why? You know, they loved their friend, but what made them think Jesus could do this? Was it just rumors? Was it just hypotheses that maybe Jesus could do these kinds of things? We don't know. Honestly, it's not given to us, so apparently it's not important that we know why they did it. But what if somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, something similar happened to them? What if they had an encounter with Jesus, a personal encounter with Jesus? Maybe it wasn't as dramatic as this. Maybe they heard the words of Jesus and knew that these were the words of God. These were the words of truth, and that truth changed their lives. And so from that point forward, they're like every situation, every problem we have, the resolution is always Jesus first. Maybe that's what was going on with these guys. We don't know. We, we do not know what was going on. Perhaps one of them had been healed. Maybe one of them had been exercised of a demon. Maybe a miracle was performed. Maybe the words impacted them. And then I also wonder, I also wonder, because this is true for most of us in this room, I also wonder if they were so passionate about bringing their friend to Jesus because at some point one of their friends was passionate about bringing them to him as well. At some point in their journey, at some point in their story, at least spiritually speaking, they were the dead man on the mat and somebody brought them to Jesus. So they knew what Jesus could do and they knew what they could do for this man. So I love their passion. These friends wanted their friend to have an encounter with Jesus and as a church, we exist for that same reason. We don't want people to come to Orlando North Church because this church is the answer to life. We want them to come to this church because Jesus, who we worship, who is the Lord of this church, is the answer to everything in their life. And through that, they, through us, they will see him. Zach quoted this earlier in, when we were doing music, John 14, 6. Jesus says this himself. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except for me. There, there, there's something different about Jesus, and these friends have experienced it, it to some degree. Even if they just heard words and believed them, to some degree, Jesus has changed their life so much that when their desperate friend has a need, they're like, Jesus is the solution. They wanted their friend to encounter Jesus. And then where it gets weird for the scribes in the room 
it's interesting to note that when Jesus sees this paralyzed man, so first of all, he commends the faith of the four, like, well done, boys, your faith is impressive. And he says to the paralytic, he says, your sins are forgiven. Do you think on the road to the house at any point, the paralytic is like, you know what my major need is? I am really hoping this Jesus guy can heal me of my sins. He's not thinking that at all, right? He's thinking, I wanna walk. His friends are like, I want him to walk. And Jesus, the very first thing out of Jesus' mouth is, son, your sins are forgiven. And as you can imagine, this caused a stir. The scribes are ticked off, and they're not voicing it because they might get killed in this room. They're, they're not in their safe space, but they're thinking it. How dare he, who is he, to say that your sins are forgiven because you realize what he's doing. In this moment, Jesus is declaring, I have the authority and the power and the right to forgive other people of their sins. In other words, I am God. And if you're a scribe, and can I confess, probably rightfully so, if you don't know who Jesus is yet and somebody comes out and says, I'm God, you're going, no, you're a quack. Like if some, listen, I give you permission. If somebody stands up in your connect group this week and says, I am the Messiah, you shut them up. No, they're not. Okay, so on the scribes' defense, this is a weird moment for them. What do they do? And Jesus reads into their spirit, into their soul, and says, which is easier? To say your, sons are, your sins are forgiven or rise up and, and walk. And I remember as a kid, because I figured the Bible was written in English because everybody spoke in English. I'm like, well, let's compare which one has more words and, and which one is easier to say. That's literally what I thought. But what Jesus is doing, he's doing something really special here, and I want to show you this. And I want us to think, think through this. What I want you to notice is that Jesus went after his heart, not after his immediate need. And, and we're like, why did you not heal him? And right off the bat, before we go any further, we still believe as a church that Jesus still heals. Jesus is a healer, that miracles can happen. But I also want to put it out there that Jesus doesn't heal all the time. And he doesn't heal everybody. If he did, when he walked this planet, he would have gone to the hospitals and emptied them. It's also interesting in John chapter 5, I don't know if you've ever wrestled with this, but in John chapter 5, there's an interesting story. It's the pool of Bethesda. And there's a bunch of crippled people and sick people laying around this pool. And every time the waters of this pool would stir, whoever got into the water first would be healed. Good for them. Kind of stinks for everybody else. Jesus shows up on the scene, and Jesus heals how many people at that pool? One. Did he have the power to heal everybody? Yeah. But he only healed one. Why would Jesus do that when we believe that Jesus is a healer? Here's what I would suggest. I would suggest, or I'd imagine, a huge part of it, a huge part of the reason why Jesus didn't just heal everybody was because that's not his mission. He didn't come to this earth to cure everybody of their disease and their human temporal sickness. He was sent to die for the sins of mankind. So our more devastating condition, our eternal condition, could be dealt with. So his mission was to die for the sins of mankind, for the sins of this paralytic, not so this paralytic could walk. He later heals the paralytic so everybody can see that he is God and what he's talking about is true. But the main thing here is the condition of this man's heart. Now, one thing I know, I don't know why Jesus doesn't heal everybody other than that's not his mission. And our sickness and our pain and our trouble, all of it, it's temporary. And we get so lost in that because that's all we know. All we know is right now, we don't have the ability to see eternally. But should we, we would realize this is just a hiccup in time. This is just, it's a very important piece of time, but it's a small portion of time. And one thing we do know, and we preach this in Revelation, there is coming a day where there will be no more sickness, no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more disease, no more crippledness, nothing like that. But today, we continue to pray for those who are sick. We'll go visit Karen this afternoon, and we will pray and hope God heals her in her body. So Jesus heals the paralytic man, but before he heals his physical body, he speaks to the deepest need and heals that spot. He forgives, forgives this man's sin. He goes beneath the surface, his obvious need, the physical need, to the man's deepest need, his need for salvation. Knowing that, hey, yeah, this guy can't walk here on earth, but if I don't do something in his heart, he's going to be eternally separated from God, and that's a much worse state than what he's got right now. 
So there are a number of reasons as to why delivering us from our sin is Jesus' primary and only mission. It's because our sin separates us from a holy God. Our sin causes many problems that we see on the news and in relationships that we live. Our sin has eternal consequences, not temporal ones, eternal consequences. And our sin is so serious in God's eyes that he sent his son Jesus to die and deal with it. And our sin is literally killing us. Let me introduce a word to you and I'm done. There's a word in the medical field, so our anesthesiologist, our nurses, all of you medical people, you know this word, but it, it, it's the word or the term palliative care. And palliative care, I'm very familiar with palliative care, and some of you guys are as well. You just didn't call it that. We know it as pain management, okay? It's pain management. Palliative care is this, when you deal with a person's pain but not the cause of the pain, right? It's when you see symptoms and these things playing out and you want to numb those things, but it doesn't resolve the primary issue, the root issue. So we're, we're going to see this problem and we're going to give some pain medication or we're going to give an injection. We're going to numb that problem so they don't feel it. But the problem is that root is still dug in deeply. We haven't dealt with that. We've just numbed everything else. That's palliative care. What you need to know is that your Savior did not come to bring pain management. He did not come to numb you of your problems. He came to deal with the root issue of your heart, which is sin. So he comes not to just make the cripple walk or to heal the abdomen of a 50-year-old dude or to repair a broken relationship. He came to deal with the sin in your heart because in the gospel, remember the gospel, God, Jesus, or God, man, Christ response, God is holy. And it starts with him. Man is depraved and wicked in our sin. There's the problem. The problem isn't cancer. The the problem isn't diabetes. The problem isn't this relationship issue. The problem is sin. Sin destroys everything, first and foremost, which is our relationship with our eternal, omnipotent God. But in his kindness and his mercy, he does for us something that we couldn't do for ourselves in the fact that he sends his son Jesus to die for us and for our sins. And then he leaves the ball in our court. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? And every time we make the secondary things of life, heal my body, which is very important. We should pray that God would touch us according to his will and his pleasure. But in any time, we're like, if you don't heal me here, If you don't do this for me, then I can't believe in you. I can't trust you. Well, you've made secondary things primary. You've got it backwards because that's not Jesus's primary concern in your life. He loves you too much to be primarily concerned with the temporal. And he loves you so deeply that his primary concern is the eternal. I have come for your soul. I have come because eternally you're gonna spend spend your eternity in one of two places, either with me in heaven or apart from me in hell. And at that point, those small-term problems that you had in your 100 years of living on planet Earth, they don't matter. So I've come to deal with the really big issues in your life. Now, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about evangelism. Evangelism. All of us who know Jesus, all of us who are following Jesus, at some point in our life, we were the dude or the girl on the mat. And we were hopeless. We were worse than the girl or the dude on the mat. We were dead. And somebody, somebody loved us enough to introduce us to the one who could resurrect us from the dead. Maybe it was a mom or a dad. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a friend, a coworker. Somebody introduced you to Jesus. And so you know what Jesus can do for you and you believe that, and you want your friends and your loved ones to come to Jesus, now it's your turn to bring the person on the mat to Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, the entire purpose of this message is to let you know it's gonna cost you something. It could cost you your reputation. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. We're gonna talk about the next two weeks, are the t- we're gonna talk about the topic of fear. For two weeks, talk about fear. Because it's going to cost you something. There's, it's just like telling your girlfriend or your boyfriend, I love you. You're risking everything. They, they might not love me back. So I might tell them about Jesus, and they might reject him completely. They might reject me completely. But if I truly believe that Jesus is the answer to their most important issue, which is sin, which is separating them from a holy God, and I love them enough, then I'm going to look past that. 
I'm going to look past the awkwardness. I'm going to look past the ramifications. I'm going to look past my, my reputation. I'm going to look past what it's going to cost me because it matters that much that this person gets to the resolution of Jesus. That's how much it matters. So when you look at the people in your mission field, and again, these are the people you work with, the people in your neighborhood, your family members who drive you bonkers, when you look at them, now you're looking at them not just in, hey, how can they fix their sin or their regular surface level problems, but how do I get them to Jesus? Do I love them enough to risk everything in my life? My reputation, what it's gonna cost me, the energy, the time, the prayer, all of it. Do I love them enough to present the gospel, the only hope for their real problem, which is the sin problem? Because at some point, somebody invited us to church. At, somebody, at some point in our life, somebody talked to us about Jesus. At some point, somebody said, hey, ask me the tough spiritual questions. I don't have all the answers, but let's talk. At some point, somebody asked you the tough spiritual question. At some point, somebody offered to pray for you and answer questions about God for you, even if they didn't have all the answers. Who was it that did this for you in your life? And now who is God calling you to do this for as you go forward? That's what this is all about. I'm telling you, evangelism, when seen properly, is such a blessing. If you've never had the opportunity to introduce somebody to Jesus, I, I don't know if there's anything greater. And, and the temptation, and in, in just remain humble in it, it's not you. Remember, it's Jesus that saves, it's not you. You're just an instrument. Your job is to bring them to the Savior. What happens from that point forward, that's between them and God. But I'm telling you, when God hears your prayers and answers them in a way where somebody that you know and somebody you've been praying for comes to Christ, nothing better. Nothing better. And that's been my prayer for you as we've walked through this series, is who are those people in our corners, in our circles, that Jesus is calling us to, to witness to, to bring them to the truth of the gospel in our lives. Let me pray for you. Jesus, you, as we've sung this morning, you are our true and only living hope. And my prayer is, before the world can see this, I pray that the church would see this, that we really would believe the gospel that we preach, the gospel we sing, the gospel that we pray and read about. I pray that it would latch onto our hearts in such a powerful and effective manner this week, that we'd be excited enthusiastic about sharing the good news with those that you put in our path. Give us boldness, give us courage to risk everything for something that's so important that those that are now lost would find hope in Jesus. And God, we thank you for the incredible blessing that you've given us to use us as vessels and instruments of salvation and for your glory. We don't save, we don't rescue, but we point people to the one who does. And I thank you for that opportunity. I, think, I, I pray that this week as we go about our days, as we go to work or school or we're in our neighborhoods, going on the walk, go to the gym, go to a restaurant, wherever we are. I pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear, hear as there are moments where you're moving and you want us to say something. Let us have that boldness and the clarity. We might not have all the answers. We might not know everything, but we know you. And help us to be bold in those moments. It's in Christ's name we pray.